Okay, so welcome to multivariable calculus. Um, the first thing that we need to talk about uh, before we get into the calculus part of multivariable calculus is uh, talk about the world where multivariable calculus happens. Now, single variable calculus, as it indicates, uh, takes place uh, uh, on a single variable axis. So all of single variable calculus happens on the x-axis. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is calculus that happens in uh, a higher dimensional space, um, such as uh, this thing that we're going to define called Rn. Um, and uh, so the first thing I want to talk about then is uh, points in Rn, and you know what is Rn and what do these points look like inside of it. So I'm going to go straight to the pictures here, and uh, here is an example of a familiar space. Uh, this is the xy plane. We have an x-axis and the y-axis. And these axes allow us to talk about points in this xy plane. Now the way we do that is the way I describe where a point is, is I look down and see where dropping a perpendicular down to the x-axis where does that land? That gives me the x-coordinate. And then I drop a perpendicular over here to the y-axis, see where that lands, that's my y-coordinate. And all together then, uh, I have two coordinates that describe the location of that point. So this then is a point. Uh, this is an algebraic description of that point in the xy plane. Okay, so I think most students have seen this before. This is a familiar idea. Uh, the observation I want to make is that there's nothing peculiar about this to two dimensions. And you can do this uh, for a three-dimensional space as well. So here's a picture of that. If you have a point then you can find sort of perpendicular um, coordinates here. And likewise, the coordinates of that point. So these then are the three coordinates of that point in this XYZ space. Okay, now let's talk about the names uh, of these spaces. Um, these spaces, as we've seen here, are described by, uh, the points in these spaces are described by, in this case, a trio of real numbers. So we say that these points are described by real, you can think of the point itself as being a trio of real numbers. We write real numbers like this, and since the points in this space are described by three real numbers, I'm going to call this R3, the very standard uh, terminology and notation. And likewise, I'm going to call this uh, R2. Sometimes we'll call this the XY plane. Sometimes we'll call this XYZ space. Okay. Now, uh, you might be tempted to say, well, you can't go any higher than that. Three dimensions is all there are. Uh, but that's not true. Uh, you can certainly talk about um, higher numbers of dimensions. Now, you can't draw these pictures. I cannot draw a four-dimensional picture. <laughs> uh, certainly not on a two-dimensional screen. I can barely draw a three-dimensional picture on a two-dimensional screen. In fact, I have to kind of cheat uh, to make it look like I've drawn a three-dimensional picture. Of course, if you, you know, think about it carefully enough, uh, there's nothing three-dimensional about that. It's a picture on a two-dimensional screen. But you can use your imagination, and this picture will help you if you are so inclined to, to visualize a three-dimensional space. But you couldn't begin to do that with four. Right? So, but certainly mathematically, you can write the same things down. So in the same sense that an ordered pair is an element of R2, in the same sense that an ordered triple is an element of R3, I could talk about ordered quadruples. And I could talk about the collection of all such ordered quadruples of real numbers, and very naturally I would call this R4. Now it's tempting at this time to say that, well, you know, when would that ever come up? Uh, we live in three-dimensional space. How would I ever need to uh, understand uh, more than a three-dimensional space? And um, 
that's a, um, a tempting line of reasoning, but it's a mistake. Um, higher than three-dimensional spaces are interesting in lots of different circumstances. Um, so, for example, the functions that you're writing down might uh, involve more than three variables because the, the variables might simply not be spatial variables. Uh, maybe, for example, let's take an economics example. Maybe you're trying to figure out a formula for uh, the profit that your company will make, and that profit is a function of several parameters. Uh, how many employees you hire, uh, how much money you borrow, uh, what the government does with interest rates, uh, what your competition uh, sets their prices at, um, uh, various other parameters that are either under your control or beyond your control, and profit will be a function of all of them. So, well, you'd be talking about uh, multivariable functions well beyond three variables. So, um, even though we can't draw the pictures, here. I can draw pictures here and here. Can't draw the pictures for these uh, more than three-dimensional spaces, but understanding them still very useful. Uh, nevertheless, in this course, we are going to be focusing mostly on R2 and R3. But I think it's important to realize as we go along through this course uh, that most of uh, what we're going to write down in in uh, most of this course uh, applies just as well for uh, higher dimensional spaces. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on now and talk about vectors. Let me very quickly first give you a definition of a vector. A vector is a combination, whoops, is a combination of a direction and a magnitude. Now, why would we be interested in such a thing? Well, it turns out that there are lots of situations in the world uh, in the physical world and uh, other um, situations where, where this combination just happens to be really useful. So let's start in the physical world and let's think about uh, discrete movements. You know, so for example, if I um, am uh, you know walking around on uh, on the street somewhere, and if I walk uh, start at a certain starting point and then walk for a little while and then have an ending point, well, I have walked in a certain direction. And in that direction, I've walked a certain distance, and the distance is what I would, how I would interpret the magnitude in this case. So a discrete movement in space is a vector, can be thought of as a vector. All right. Um, another example, velocity. So velocity represents uh, you know, the rate at which I'm moving uh, in space. Well, um, <clears throat> if I'm moving with a certain velocity, I'm moving in, in a certain direction. Right? Now, in this case, velocity isn't in, we don't think of velocity in terms of you know, distance. We think of it in terms of speed. So the associated magnitude, you know, in a certain direction, my velocity, you know, how much in that direction, that magnitude is speed. Nevertheless, different notion of magnitude, but there's still an associated notion of magnitude. So velocity, like displacement, has a direction and a magnitude, and therefore can be thought of as a vector. Okay. Now, uh, independent of movements, here's another one, forces. Well, forces are important uh, objects of study in physics and engineering, and they have directions. You know, forces always pull or push in a certain direction. And furthermore, forces either more or less in that direction thus have a magnitude. And therefore, forces can be thought of as vectors. So there are lots of objects, lots of concepts can, can be thought of as a combination of direction and magnitude and thus a vector. So this is an important object to study, and in multivariable calculus, it's, it's a, a fundamental tool for how we um, understand um, the calculus of multivariable functions. All right. So let's talk about how to draw these things. I mean, how would I represent such a such a uh, uh, combination here? Um, two seemingly different things. A direction we think of maybe in terms of angles or something, and uh, magnitudes we think of as numbers. Well, they seem kind of different. It turns out that there's a wonderfully simple way uh, to represent that. 
and that is that we can visualize this pair with an arrow. It's the perfect little geometric tool uh, to visualize. So for example, thinking of a vector representing displacements. If I start here and end there, thereby I'm going in that direction by that distance, I just draw an arrow. Let me do that in a different color. I draw this arrow whose tail is at the starting point and whose head is at the end point. It's the perfect tool to represent that uh, displacement. Uh, similarly, for velocities, well, the direction that I'm moving combined with the magnitude, in this case the speed. Now I'm going to represent that speed with a length of an arrow. But the point is these are both real numbers and I can just interpret magnitude uh, of the arrow as being the speed of the movement. And punchline then, an arrow represents both of those things, both the direction and that speed, magnitude. Okay. So, a um, great way to think about vectors is by representing them with arrows. Now, uh, here's a couple of uh, examples. In R2, there's a, an arrow representing a vector. By the way, when we write a vector, so this is the vector V, you'll notice that I've put a little, a little hat, a little arrow-like hat uh, over the V. Uh, this is a visual cue to the reader. Uh, just kind of a reminder that, hey, by the way, this V thing, that's not a number. It's not a real number. That's a vector. And so uh, it, it's, um, like I say, it's intended as an assistance to the reader. Um, a lot of advanced books that are talking about multivariable this or that uh, won't do that anymore. Uh, the the um, definitions of the objects in question will make it clear whether it's a vector or a scalar or uh, whatever kind of an object it is. And they won't give you the little visual reminder. Uh, in this textbook, I am going to use the this little visual reminder, um, the little hat, the little arrow hat on top of the vector, um, uh, just to make things a little easier for students. Okay. Okay, and then here's a vector in R3. Right. Now, I want to point out there's an important point to be made about, you know, again, the relationship between vectors and arrows. Uh, vectors are the objects of interest, a combination of direction and a magnitude. An arrow is a tool that we use to represent that vector, that object of interest. The trouble with arrows is we have to. <laughs> draw them, and we have to draw them somewhere. So, for example, here I've drawn an arrow that I have highlighted here, uh, representing a certain direction and a certain magnitude. Now, I might have in my mind had a reason to put the tail of that arrow at that point. So maybe this, uh, the, the vector that I'm representing with this arrow uh, represents a force that's acting at that point, you know, pushing something at that point with that certain force, that direction, that magnitude. Or maybe this arrow represents a vector which uh, maybe is representing velocity. Maybe this is where I currently am, and that's the velocity with which I'm moving. But independent of that, I think it's important to realize that uh, I could have drawn different arrows to represent the exact same vector. Look at these four here. All four of these arrows that I've drawn, they point in exactly the same direction uh, to the limit of my uh, abilities to draw. Um, so, <laughs> um, And they have the exact same magnitude. So even though there's technically four separate arrows written there, they all represent the same vector. So a vector is a little bit of an abstract thing. You can't really exactly sort of put your finger on it. It's it's a, it's a it's a um, it's not a fixed point per se. It's a uh, it's something that relates to points, but a vector itself is just a direction and a magnitude, and you can represent it in lots of different ways uh, with lots of different arrows. Okay. All right. Yeah.
Okay. So now we've talked about uh, the difference between vectors and points. Points are locations, right? They're spots, places, you might say, in uh, in Rn, R2 or R3. Again, you can visualize what we're doing in just R2 or R3. Vectors are this new idea that we've just talked about that represent, um, well, lots of possibly different things uh, in terms of you know how you're applying them, how you're thinking about them, but vectors represent directions and magnitudes in general. So the surprising thing is that even though they are very different things, there is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between them. So for any point, there is a naturally correlated vector. And for any vector, there is that, turning it around the other way, naturally correlated point. Okay. So how does that work? Uh, well, that works um, by way of this concept of uh, standard position. This is what standard position looks like. Um, this arrow is representing a vector in standard position. Now, this, all of these different arrows, again, modulo my artistic abilities, all of those arrows point in the same direction and have the same magnitudes. All of these vectors, all of these arrows represent the exact same vector. This is the one that we'll say is in standard position. Standard position meaning that its tail is at the origin. Okay. And uh, that is the tool that allows us to define this natural one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between points and vectors. And it goes by way of this picture. Uh, if you were to give me a point and ask me what is the corresponding vector, here's the way you do it. That point is the head of a unique arrow in standard position. And there is a unique arrow whose tail is at the origin and whose head is at that given point. That arrow then represents a certain vector. All right. So again, just to emphasize that vectors don't really, vectors are not pinned down in any place. I'm drawing several of them. So three different arrows, but this is a single vector. So that green point corresponds to this blue vector. Okay. Um, going the other direction. Suppose you're given a vector, a direction and a magnitude. Uh, whoops. There's a direction and a magnitude. What is the corresponding point? What point corresponds to that vector? Well, what you're going to do is take that direction and magnitude, find the corresponding arrow in standard position, namely with its tail at the origin. That vector, that arrow with its tail at the origin has its head in a certain location, that's the corresponding point. So standard position is really the, um, the, the way we draw this connection between points and vectors. And this is a very strong connection. It's a very valuable uh, observation. Um, in fact, we're going to use this um, lots and lots throughout this course. Um, in fact, the way that I'm going to represent a vector algebraically, I'm going to write the coordinates of the associated point. That's certainly a, uh, I mean, I can uniquely describe which vector I'm talking about just by saying, well, look, that vector corresponds to a certain point. That point has certain coordinates. If I give you the coordinates of the point, then you can infer the vector. Okay. All right. Um, very often, I'm going to refer to a point by its position vector. Um, very often, even though points and vectors are not the same thing, it can be more convenient to deal with the vector associated to that point than with the point itself. We're going to see some examples of this uh, momentarily. Okay. So um, what we're doing here is actually kind of, again, sort of blurring the distinction between points and vectors. And this, I you know, this is, can be problematic. And certainly in some situations beyond the context of Math 212, uh, this course in multivariable calculus, um, uh, the distinction is critical between points and vect vectors. They're very much not the same thing, and, and uh, in these more sophisticated contexts, they are not even close to the same thing, and there is no correlation uh, between them.
But in this situation, there really is. And there's some nice value in blurring this distinction. Um, and again, we'll see this uh, as we go along. Um, the the uh, problem with blurring the distinction is then the reader can't immediately see wh which are we talking about. Are we talking about a point or are we talking about a vector? And the thing is, is that the context should always make this clear. Right? So look for the context. Um, if something is given and you're not clear if you should interpret it as a point or a vector, there will be context clues. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a couple of minutes. Okay. All right. So let's see here. All right. So uh, sometimes, again, you, know, you might have a point. Let's say your point is called P. Um, there will be a corresponding position vector. And sometimes this is a more convenient notation. Uh, than that. Um, how do we represent that vector? Well, we're going to represent the vector by, you know, again, writing the coordinates of the point. <laughs> okay, really blurring that distinction. Now, some textbooks uh, will emphasize the distinction by when writing down the coordinates of a vector to be thought of as a vector we'll put these triangular braces instead of the round braces, you know, parentheses. Um, <clears throat> so be aware of that. I'm not going to be doing that in this textbook, um, but uh, that's uh, certainly out there. And uh, again, this uh, is um, uh, emphasizing, uh, it's providing clarity uh, on what is, in fact, technically a different thing. Uh, but uh, again, I think context will make it clear in this, uh, in this textbook. Okay. Um, some other notations. Again, you know, now the notation that you're probably more accustomed to to seeing vectors uh, described is, uh, well, to seeing points described, and here we're describing vectors like points, uh, is uh, coordinates separated by commas and written horizontally. Turns out that there are some circumstances, and we're going to see those in this book, where it's highly advantageous to write it vertically. Uh, so to sort of stack these coordinates on top of each other instead of side to side. Uh, so uh, again, you know, in some situations that we'll see mm, a few lectures forward from here, uh, a few weeks into the course, actually, uh, this becomes really important. And even in some uh, uh, non-critical contexts that we'll see today. Uh, it can be very convenient to write these vertically. Um, there's a definite disadvantage to that, and that is look how much space it takes up on the page. Uh, just to write this one little equation here, we oh gosh, we lose um, quite a bit of, of vertical distance on the page. So for typesetting reasons, it's awkward. Um, and this is much more compact in that sense. So that, there is advantages and disadvantages. You will see both uh, of these notations. So you know, heads up and be on the lookout for both of them. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this picture for a moment. <clears throat> Here's a line in R2. And here's a vector. And let me start by speaking loosely. You'll notice that that vector, V, and this line have, a, uh, have something in common. They seem to share something. There's a relationship between these. How would I describe this relationship between this vector and this line? Now, it's tempting, very tempting, to say, oh, V is on L. And you look at the picture, I mean, you see the V, the highlighted purple V there, and the, the line L is in blue, and the, the, the head, the tail, the shaft, the whole thing there, a V appears to be on that line. And I claim that's really actually pretty bad language. Um, you can't describe V as being on the line, because remember, V is a vector. Vectors don't have locations. The, the direction and magnitude described by that arrow is just as well described by that arrow and that arrow and that arrow. So now let's consider again, is this vector in fact on the line? Well, no. Some of the vectors representing it don't even touch the line. Right? So 
let's consider better language. Now, one thing that all of these vectors have in common with the line is that they point in the same direction. So what would be better language here is to say that V is parallel to L. That would be a much better description of what's going on here. Okay. Now, uh, what could go wrong if you just say, well, okay, fine. Uh, I'm still going to say V is on the line. Come on, you know what I mean. In fact, no, there's a serious problem that would come up. Um, if you say V is on a line, and keeping in mind that vectors um, do not have locations, if you say on, as if you're talking about a location, the natural interpretation would be to think that maybe when you're talking about that vector, maybe that you're saying vector to be interpreted as a point because points do have location. So if you talk about V being at a certain location, which one of these interpretations, points or vectors, have locations? Well, points. If you say V is at a certain location, sounds like you're talking about it as a point and interpret it as a point, that's a vector that's actually on that line. So you could be terribly misunderstood. If you say a vector is on a line, they might think you're talking about this when you're actually talking about this. So be very careful with your language. Think carefully about what you mean. What is it that you're trying to describe and what is the object that you're talking about? Are you talking about a location? If you are, you're talking about a point and use language accordingly. If you're talking about directions, and that's what that's what this uh, that's the shared feature in this little picture here. We're not talking about locations. We're talking about directions then use again correspondingly the right terminology. Okay. Now, so let's do a little bit of algebra now, finally. Um, here's an old formula. If I want to know that distance, well, that distance is equal to that squared plus that squared. It's the old quadratic equation. Oh, excuse me, the old uh, Pythag... <laughs> Gosh, the old Pythagorean equation, and uh, in particular, now normally we just call this the hypotenuse, right? And so this would be uh, the hypotenuse is the square root of the sum of the squares here. Um, but now notice that that hypot what that hypotenuse is is it's the magnitude that we associate to a particular vector. So we have a notation for this: the magnitude of a certain vector v. To denote with these double bars on either side. Okay. All right, so with that notation in mind, that is sort of a rephrasing of the Pythagorean theorem. <coughs> okay, as it applies to this right triangle. Okay. Now, a related question how would we compute the magnitude of a three dimensional vector? So a vector in R3. Now there's an interesting geometry problem here. Uh, I'm going to sketch the picture that goes into answering this question. And of course the answer is here in this book already. But I think it would be a good exercise to, uh, to write down the argument that I'm about to illustrate here. And so we have a uh, vector, v1, v2, v3. It has a, an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate and a z-coordinate. So there's that vector, v. Hmm, and we don't immediately have a triangle. We have, gosh, uh, we have a, well, that's a right angle and that's a right angle. But uh, this is uh, not exactly a triangle that I have drawn. Now, the good news is I can add in a new edge. I can add in that edge. And you can use the Pythagorean equation 
relate uh, V1 and V2 to this green edge that, uh, let's see, I guess I'll call it, um, I'll call it D. Well, that's just the good old Pythagorean equation. So write that down. Write down, you know, what can you say about D in terms of V1 and V2. Now, that having been done, don't forget that this is V3. So then there is a separate uh, Pythagorean equation that you can write down. Oh, I guess I'll, mm. oh, I'm having indecision problems on colors. Uh, I'll use red, I guess. Concerning that triangle. Now again, note that's a right triangle. Right? Um, so it's a right triangle, so there's a Pythagorean relation. And in particular, what it does is it relates, among other things, the magnitude of V that we are looking for with V3 that was given and D that we just got through relating to V1 and V2. So uh, if you take those two Pythagorean uh, equations and sort of smash them together, uh, what you will end up with is a formula for computing the magnitude of that vector v, the length of that vector v. And here's what you end up with. Again, I leave the exercises uh, to the to the listener, and it'd be a nice uh, practice problem uh, to actually do that. Okay. Now, uh, one other thing I want to talk about is a notational point. Um, I'm going to come back up here again to give myself a little bit of space to work with. And let's talk about vectors in R1. So a vector in R1 is described by, well, just a single coordinate. So if I have, well, I'll do this with a color. If I have, you know, some value, what I call it, yeah, single number V. I guess I could call it V1, but let's just call it V. This isn't an ordered triple, and it's not an ordered pair. It's just a single number. So <laughs> this is how you would represent a vector in R1. Okay. So what can I say about its magnitude? Well, as I have it drawn here, the magnitude of that vector is, uh, well, I mean, just a little, the number that I have drawn here is positive, so that distance is just that number is V. Okay. Um, on the other hand, now let's consider a different case. Uh, let's consider a number over here, thought of as a vector. And maybe I'll call this one um, W. So that, you know, as a vector is just W, it's an ordered single. Um, so what's the magnitude of that? Uh, oh yeah, so again, thought of as a vector. Well, it's that distance. Now, you can't say that that magnitude is W because W is a negative number. You can see that right there on the picture. So what it is, is it's the absolute value of W. So an observation could be made, and that is that, well, in, we already considered the case where V is positive, and we got that the magnitude was just V. But if V is positive, then that also is the absolute value. So what we see is, in the case of real numbers, you know, confined to just, you know, an x-axis, magnitude is synonymous with absolute value. So uh, now in R2 and R3, et cetera, there is no pre-existing notion of absolute value. So this notation heretofore has only been used in uh, the one-dimensional case. And in that one-dimensional case, magnitude is the exact same thing as that. So there's a pretty good argument that says that what we're really talking about here with magnitude is just... Uh, a generalization of the notion of absolute value. And so lots of books will use notation that looks like absolute value notation to indicate the magnitude of a vector. And it's a very reasonable choice. Um, I personally kind of like the, uh, the, the uh, double bars. Again, I think it's a nice visual reminder uh, that, uh, that we're talking about something fundamentally different from a number here. We're talking about a vector, very different thing. And 
Um, the visual cue, I think, is, is helpful. Um, it not important, though. Uh, this is a perfectly reasonable uh, ultimate notation. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about some algebraic operations. Um, and the very first one I'm going to talk about is addition. So a very good question to start with is, uh, let's not ask the question, how do you add two vectors? What's the formula for adding two vectors? That's, I think that's the wrong question to start with. I would like to start with asking, what should it mean to add two vectors? And we're defining a new operation here, uh, but why write down a formula just arbitrarily? Um, we want to make sure that the formula we write down is natural some way, that it, that it uh, dovetails helpfully uh, with uh, some either geometric or physical uh, application that we're going to be using a lot um, so, that it, uh, so that it's helpful, so that it's useful. So um, the way I'm going to approach this problem, if we're going to be adding vectors, let's remind ourselves how do we think about vectors? What are these things that vectors represent? And well, one of the basic motivating concepts for what vectors represent is the idea of a discrete movement. And I think this is the most convenient and uh, easy way to think about uh, to sort of motivate vector addition. So <clears throat> to, to, to get to the question of what it should mean to add two vectors, let's instead ask, what should it mean to add two discrete movements. And uh, I think it would be pretty natural to do the first movement and subsequently do the other movement. That's pretty natural, right? I mean, if you're, think of it as, uh, you know, if you're following certain directions, if uh, direct instruction one says move in that direction by that distance, and then instruction two says, well, now move in that direction by that distance. Well, if you follow those instructions as listed, then having started at the origin, you move that direction by that distance, and then the next thing you would do from where you now currently are, you would move that direction by that distance. So I think a pretty natural and reasonable definition of what it should mean to add two vectors motivated by this metaphor of adding two discrete movements would be that. Namely, we started the whole operation here. After doing the one operation and then the other, you know, the one instruction and then the other, we ended up there all together. I started there, ended there, Altogether, I displace myself by that vector. So this is the picture that I want to use to motivate our idea of what it should mean to add two vectors. Um, <clears throat> now, if you do that, you get this formula. And uh, the details are a little geometry problem that the reader can uh, do for uh, him or herself. This vector, the sum of the two vectors, the coordinates of that sum are going to be the coordinates of the first vector uh, plus, uh, whoops, plus, I guess I did this in green, plus the coordinates of the second vector. Okay. So now, while we're here, I want to take this opportunity to show one of the advantages of writing vectors vertically. This is a nice opportunity to sort of squeeze this in. And that is that um, <clears throat> let's rewrite this formula. I have there, you know, given that a vector uh, v is uh, v1 plus v, uh, v1 comma v2 and w is w1 comma w2, then their sum is that. Let me just write the same thing now using vertical notation. So I'm going to write over here V plus W equals, and now let me write down the coordinates of the sum vector. The first coordinate is V1 plus uh, W1, and the second uh, coordinate, V2 
plus W2. So conveniently, this is really kind of beautiful, because we rode the vectors vertically, you get this really sort of comfortable motivation, notational to be fair, but um, for, for you know why it would make sense to add vectors that way. Now it's not intuitively satisfying, but it's notationally satisfying um, that you, uh, uh, you add vectors by coordinates. You add their first coordinates and then you add their second coordinates. Okay, so again, now this is just sort of notational convenience. This is not a deep point, but I think nevertheless, uh, this is a good opportunity uh, for using that vertical notation to represent vectors. Okay. Oh, where am I? Here we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. Okay, so we've talked about what it means to add a vector and another vector. Here's our, our, here's our picture. Here's our formula. Now, related question. Uh, what should it mean to add a point and a vector? Well, now look, if we want to be rigid about this, then uh, these are different things. And a point is not the same thing as a vector. Uh, so this is a new question. Uh, what does it mean to add a point and a vector? Well, you can again, you can motivate this in different ways. And what I like to point out um, is that um, the way that we end up with an answer on this is very conveniently to blur the distinction. So to think of a point as a vector. So in other words, let's interpret the point by its corresponding vector, its position vector, at which, uh, having done so, we're kind of adding a vector and a vector, which we already have a formula for. So if you have a point, oh, where's my picture? Mm -hmm. I don't have a picture for this. Let me draw a picture. Yeah, let me draw a picture here. If you have a point, uh, and a vector, a pretty reasonable way to motivate what it should mean to add these things would be to interpret the point as a vector and then add this point and this vector and again you know you sort of head to tail uh, it doesn't matter which order you go in by the way and so I'm going to put this up there like that and then the sum would be that vector. So um, <clears throat> technically a different thing, but you can see how we connect it back to the idea of uh, adding two vectors. Now uh, let's uh, rewind a little bit here and again go back to the question of a point and a vector. And let's say, well, I don't want to. I don't want to conflate uh, points and vectors. Let's keep them separate. Now, rigidly keeping these ideas separate, what should it mean to add a point and a vector? Well, a, another reasonable interpretation of what it might mean to add a point and a vector is that you would start at the point and then displace yourself by that vector. And that would end up putting you at that point. So does it matter? Well, in fact, notice what we've got having in strictly interpreted the point as a point and the vector as a vector and, and viewing the vector as a displacement and you know keeping the lines from blurring. What I've got is in fact equivalent to that picture that I drew in the first place. Right? Um, so we now have the sum being thought of as a point instead of the sum being thought of as a vector, but it's the same um, over, oh, whoops, same overall thing. Okay, so take your preference on uh, how we define uh, point plus vector. I think the fact that this formula ends up being just so similar to the formula we already had is pretty strong motivation for blurring the distinction. It makes life simpler. We can interpret this as a single operation independent of whether reviewing is a point or a vector or what have you, as opposed to having to have a different 
mm, symbol representing what is what would then have to be a different operation, and I, it's just why bother? It's the same answer either way. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, next question: What should it mean to multiply a vector times a scalar? Now let me, let me go up to this picture here. If a vector uh, represents a direction and a magnitude, and let's think of this as a displacement. If I have a vector pointing in a certain direction that says, you know, displace in that direction by a certain magnitude, what should c times that be? Well, again, it's a choice, uh, but a reasonable choice would seem to be to say that we're going to move in the same direction and we're just in that same direction going to move a, a magnitude that is c times as much. So this is a, uh, a geometrically satisfying uh, motivation for what we should define to be a scalar c times a vector v. And that gives this formula. And again, the interested reader can confirm uh, that this vector here uh, points in the same direction and with a magnitude c times as much, uh, on the assumption that the scalar c is positive. Now, what should it mean if there's a minus sign? Oh, well, gosh, let's see here. If I'm pointing in that direction and I want to move, let's suppose I want to move instead of twice that, suppose I want negative 2 times this. Well, I mean, what would we do with that minus sign? A, a, a reasonable choice would be to say that the 2, again, should scale the magnitude. What would that minus sign do? Well, it would be pretty reasonable to say that the minus sign should just say move in the exact opposite direction. Well, yeah, it's a reasonable choice. Um, conveniently, you end up with the same formula. So when c is negative, this formula is motivated by that picture. And again, it'd be a nice exercise for the reader to think that through and confirm that this formula works with both, whether c is positive or negative, works with both of these images that we have uh, motivating you know, what we want CV uh, to be defined as. Okay, um, gosh, I hit the wrong button there, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> So uh, an algebra exercise that students can work out. Again, I'm going to leave the details uh, to the reader. But the magnitude of a scaled vector relates to the magnitude of the original vector by way of the absolute value of the scalar. Now, it's very tempting to... Um, very tempting to write this down and to sort of figure, okay, you know what, I can take that scalar and just pop it out there to the outside, uh, then resulting in C as the magnitude of V. And this is wrong. It sort of has to be wrong if you think about it, um, because this is positive. That's a magnitude. It's a... It's a uh, it's a positive number. It, it can't be negative. It's a distance. Distances are always uh, positive or zero, I suppose, so non-negative. Um, and likewise, that, non-negative. C is not so constrained. C could be negative. How could you have a negative number? Uh, this C here could be negative, and negative times positive simply is not equal to positive. So this formula can't be right. And you've got to have this absolute value in there. Now, um, again, I want to leave it to the students to uh, work this out uh, on your own. And I want to say a couple of quick words about uh, where that absolute value is going to come from in the process. You know, when you write down what the vector CV is, and you take the absolute value, take the uh, magnitude of that using the formulas on the previous page, and you do a little factoring. At some point, you're going to find yourself looking at this, square root of c squared. A lot of high school courses, I'm going to put a question mark on there to avoid having a falsehood here, but um, a lot of high school courses would say that 
square roots undo squares, and so the square root of c squared is just c. And that's not true. That is uh, a problem. It's an important problem. And specifically, uh, the problem is that this symbol here, that square root symbol, means, oh, what did I just do there? Means um, positive. Specifically means positive. Now, a real number, a positive real number, does have two square roots, plural. Right? There are two of them. But this symbol here refers to the positive of those two square roots. So uh, this equation just is simply not true as written. Um, the true version of this is that the square root of c squared is the absolute value of c. If c is a negative number, this still works. Okay, so um, something to think through. Again, you know, if you if your uh, algebra experience uh, didn't emphasize this uh, issue, you might want to sort of think through and uh, make a mental note that when you're going through and uh, relating squares and square roots, you know, keep in mind that you've got to pop an absolute value in there uh, in order to to um, have a valid conclusion. Okay. Okay, so moving along. Um, how do you subtract two vectors? What should that mean? Well, um, maybe that's not the right question in this case. Uh, we, we asked, uh, and I think correctly, the question, what should it mean to add two vectors? And we asked, you know, what should it mean to multiply a vector times a scalar, but I, at this point, I'm going to note that we don't really have a choice anymore on what subtraction ought to mean. We don't have that much freedom. And the reason why is subtraction is a combination of vector addition, which I have now defined, and scalar vector multiplication which I have now defined. So subtraction has to be, the, the formula for V minus W has to be that. And I don't really have any remaining flexibility or uh, you know, uh, choice to interpret uh, in a different way. So that's what subtraction has to be. Um, a different way to say that, the difference of two vectors has to be the thing that I would add to W to get V. <laughs> so this actually, uh, I, I think this is a nice uh, algebraic version of how to write subtraction because it gives rise to such a wonderful little picture here. Uh, here it is. If you have a vector V and a vector W, the difference V minus W has to be the thing that you add I'll do this in purple, to W, I mean W plus V minus W, uh, the minus W and the plus W cancel, and you'd better get V. Okay, so uh, said differently, we have a nice picture for interpreting uh, the difference of two vectors. The difference of two vectors is the vector that goes from the head of that vector in standard position to the head of that vector in standard position. <coughs> Just interpreting straight from this picture here. Okay. Um, a way I can connect this back to uh, addition, uh, I think this is kind of a nice point of view, uh, given a uh, vector V, you can think of W, when you add W, what you're doing is you're effectively, oh gosh, uh, bad drawing, uh, effectively kind of moving the head. It's like, well, the head was here, and then by way of adding W, you're moving the head up to there to get the sum. So adding a vector W, you can think of that as moving the head of the vector that you're adding it to.
looking back at subtraction, given a vector <laughs> v, subtracting w leaves the head put. The head doesn't move. You can think of subtracting w as moving the tail. to result in that vector. So just a different way to think about it, you can think of addition as moving the head of the vector you're adding to. You can think of subtraction, let me color code, subtraction, you can think of as moving the tail of the vector that you're subtracting from. Okay. All right, so we've defined uh, vector additions. Uh, we've defined a vector subtraction. Uh, we've defined a, uh, a, a, a how am I going to write this? A scalar vector multiplication. It's it's not we're not multiplying two vectors here. Critically, we're multiplying a scalar times a vector. Nevertheless, we have several new operations here. They're brand new. We just defined them. We're using familiar old symbols. You know, I mean that's an old symbol that most students have seen since early elementary school. Uh, this symbol again. A, goes way back. Students saw this back in early elementary school. But I can't emphasize enough, nevertheless, these are new operations as we're writing them down. So let's look at the various properties that we have and <clears throat> I think it's worth noticing that even though this little formula here looks trite, it looks like old news. Oh gosh, V plus W equals W plus V. Yeah, I've known that since I was Oh gosh, uh, so long ago I don't even remember how old it was. Um, no, that was a brand new fact because the, even though that is the same symbol we've seen since elementary school, in this usage it's a brand new operation. So this fact here is not obvious. This is something that has to be shown. Um, and there's a little bit of work to be done there. And the good news is it's uh, well, the, the best news is that it's true. Um, the good news is that it's uh, not that hard to show. Uh, it's just a matter of writing down uh, what the coordinates of these two vectors are. And I'm going to write this down uh, real quick. Let's write down what is v plus w. We'll do this for two-dimensional vectors. v plus w is v1 plus w1, v2 plus w2. That's what the left side is there. Okay, what is W plus V? Well, now, it's a different thing. W is on the left now. V is on the right. So, going straight and strictly from the definition that I'm given, W plus V is W1 plus V1, W2 plus V2. So, now, how do I prove that these things are the same thing? Well, conveniently, one at a time, the coordinates work out. V1 plus W1 and W1 plus V1 are equal. Now, now, why is that okay? Why am I allowed to use this commutativity of addition there while I'm proving commutativity of addition here? And that's because this is the old notion of addition. Here we're adding good old fashioned elementary school style real numbers. And the good old elementary school addition is long since known to be commutative. So no problems. And likewise here, V2 plus W2 is W2 plus V2 because there again we're adding real numbers and we know that addition of real numbers commutes. Okay. so. Arguments along these lines um, allow you to show the rest of these facts. Uh, I encourage uh, listeners to, um, you know, maybe do a couple of these um, and uh, confirm using, you know, break down each side of both of all these equations and uh, break it down to a question of coordinates and observe that those coordinates that need to equal actually are equal and they are equal because of facts that we know from elementary school. Okay, okay so uh, moving along, um, a couple of little 
uh, miscellanies uh, to talk about. I have to tell you what a unit vector is. These are going to be special objects in this course. Uh, it's a vector of magnitude 1, any vector whose magnitude ha happens to equal to 1. Um, so again, th these are um, special in this course. Uh, one immediate um, uh, convenience I can tell you about unit vectors is there's always a unique unit vector pointing in a given direction. There's exactly one. There's lots of vectors that point in a given direction. There's always exactly one unit vectors. So, in fact, when we want to represent just a direction, not a direction and a magnitude, as would be done by a vector, if we want to represent just the direction itself, a pretty natural choice is to pick this unit vector uh, pointing in that given direction. Okay. Um, certain unit vectors of interest are the standard basis vectors. These are the vectors that point along the coordinate axes. So in R2, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Here's our coordinate axes. Um, <coughs> E1 is that vector, unit vector, pointing along the first coordinate axis. E2 is that vector, unit vector, pointing along that second coordinate axis. Uh, the subscript, you'll notice, uh, indicates which coordinate axis it's pointing along. So E1 along the first coordinate axis and E2 along the second coordinate axis. That also indicating where the one coordinate is in the um, ordered pair. Okay. Analogously, uh, these are the standard basis vectors in R3. So again, let's draw a picture. Oh gosh, um, there we go. So, E1 points like that, E2 points like that, and E3 points like that. Oh, I kind of messed up that. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay, so again, the subscript here indicates along which axis, you know, the first, second, or third, uh, the uh, vector points, and you'll notice that that subscript also tells you where's the one in either the first, second, or third position. Okay. Um, sometimes these are uh, represented instead by whoops uh, by um, I, J, and K. Um, very common. Uh, the trouble with the I, J, and K notational choice is that uh, it's mm, convenient though it is in three space, in two space, and in three space. Um, if you want to use that as a notational convention to talk about um, higher dimensional spaces, um, then you run out of letters pretty fast, right? I mean, so let's. What would you do in R four? I, J, K, L. I suppose. What would you do in R17? Well, gosh, um, you'd be using the entire alphabet pretty quickly. <laughs> you can see that it's a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I like this, um, this notation where we use E's with a subscript. Um, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it generalizes nicely, and it's, it's also just kind of visually recognizable. A vector called E represents a standard basis vector. Okay. Algebraically, this uh, subscript is also um, uh, pretty handy on some occasions uh, that will come up. Okay. So uh, one last trick for this section. I want to talk about um, given a, uh, a non-zero vector. And now keep in mind, a non-zero vector has a direction and a magnitude. And I might uh, at some point um, Want to talk about just the mag, just the uh, excuse me, just the um, direction. So in other words, I might want to know the unit vector that points 
in that same direction. And there's this lovely little formula here for how to do that. Uh, you take the vector v that you were given, you divide it by its own magnitude, and that result, that fraction, is the unit vector pointing in that direction. And it's not hard to see that this is a unit vector if you compute its magnitude. The details of the calculation are here. Uh, the magnitude of that vector, well, there's the definition of that vector. So um, notice then that there is a, a real number here that factors out with absolute values. Don't forget those absolute values. Good news, magnitudes are positive. That means that we have here the absolute value of a positive number, and so I can just rewrite it without the absolute values. That's very handy. And then that cancels that, and I'm left with just uh, one. Uh, and so this vector is a unit vector because its magnitude is one. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, that's it for section 1.2. Um, let me give a very quick preview of what we're going to do in the next section. Uh, in the next section here, we're going to talk about uh, dot products. This is a way to multiply two vectors. Now you'll notice conspicuously absent from what we did last time was any sense of multiplying two vectors. We talked about multiplying a scalar times a vector. But we didn't talk about multiplying a vector times another vector. And it turns out that there are actually two really geometrically natural definitions that can be made that could be very naturally and reasonably thought of as multiplications. So we're actually going to end up with two kinds of vector products. And there's nothing unreasonable about that. Um, it didn't happen for real numbers, but that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with vectors. Um, so um, we'll see the details uh, next time. Um, but uh, this is the big idea. We want to try to make sense out of what should it mean to multiply uh, two vectors. Okay, we'll pick up here next time.